Well, Everett Jerkson used to tell a story about a preacher who was in his pulpit and only one parishioner had showed up and the preacher said, well, I guess since, uh, since you're here, only one will skip it till next week. And the guy said, well, if I was a farmer and I came down with a load of hay at the gate and there's only one lone cow, I'd feed that cow. So the preacher said, all right, and he delivered his greatest lecture, just blew him away. And the guy said, if I had a load of hay and there's only one lone cow, I'd feed that cow, but I wouldn't drop the whole load. <laughs> I'm going to drop the whole load. It was a song of immense deliverance. Do you know that line? Very beginning of the final two-page section about the Shrugged. Well, Ayn Rand's work represents deliverance. For many of us as individuals, potentially for her adopted homeland, potentially for the very role of reason in human society, perhaps for the future of mankind, I focus here on a different deliverance. I think that the quotation which captures the effect on Dagny of the music of a great romantic composer is germane to this sense of deliverance. Ayn Rand delivered art from the crushing dogma of realism, which she called naturalism, by resuscitating its opposite, the school of romanticism, after its near-death near experience. If art, as she says, builds the model, defined by ethics, giving us the inspiration of meeting and knowing the ideal man. If art is the way a mind can be awakened to the world of moral values and sustained by the emotional fuel that art provides, then this was deliverance, most deeply personal to the individual. Let me make it personal. For me, the one overwhelming experience of objectivism was reading Atlas Shrugged. And at that moment, coming to love Dagny, Hank, Francisco, John, just that personal, the experience of art. I urge you to consider today that Ayn Rand's resuscitation of the Romantic movement that to all appearances had died of its philosophical contradictions was among her most original achievements. She did at least three needful things. She grasped the singular and irreplaceable role of art, but particularly Romantic art in human consciousness in her teenage years, romantic art was still a contemporary re reality, at least in French literature and music. She devoted her career to writing a romantic novel so great that no cultural killers could strangle it in its crib. Like the infant Hercules, Atlas reached out to seize the two serpents by their necks and never let go. She worked out a philosophy of art, of aesthetics, integrated into the structure of an entire philosophy of reason, egoism, and individualism. She set out the relationship of romantic art to metaphysics, epistemology, and ethics. And then she explained how her theory was psychologically actualized in the achievement of art's effects, including a child's development of a moral sense of life. Not least, like her idol Victor Hugo, she wrote essays about the glory of art, its sacred role in man's soul, and specific works of art and did so in an astonishingly colorful, logically compelling essays. Readers who had never thought about aesthetics, art's role in a culture, and art's decisive impact on human development and motivation, sat up, frowned, and took notice. These were life and death matters for each soul, for any culture. To harken back to my statement a bit earlier, my thesis is that the resuscitation of romanticism in the form of romantic realism was Ayn Rand's single most original philosophical achievement. But after all, why get into the irresolvable quibble? I mean, what was God's greatest achievement? That he created the female human breast or that he knew a good thing when he saw it and made two of them? <laughs> in most of her philosophy, Ayn Rand is not a fount of new philosophical ideas, what we label originality. How could she be? She searched for human greatness and had the honesty to herald it wherever she found it. Aristotle, 
Thomas Aquinas, John Locke, Thomas Jefferson, in arguments against God's existence, David Hume, Adam Smith and some of the French philosophers, and then von Mises in the Austrian school, and in thought about how political structures free man's productive energy, Isabel Patterson and Herbert Spencer, in Romanticism, the great tradition that culminated with Victor Hugo. The fashion of 20th century philosophy has been a scorched earth originality. All philosophy before my school was diluted. Metaphysics is mere myth. Only linguistic analysis is truly doing philosophy. No abstract principles are valid. The truth of an idea is in its practice, its pragmatic results. Truth is not any given idea. It's your existential commitment to an idea, any idea, especially if it makes you nauseous. Ayn Rand's towering achievement was to identify by the most rigorous standards all the best in the Western tradition since Aristotle, ruthlessly select the essential and integrate it with a brilliance that multiplied its value, then apply it to more contemporary issues than perhaps any philosopher and present it to new generations. We know she believed there were challenges she had to overcome in that tradition. Kantian school's mission to reinfect the Enlightenment, uh, the devastating contradiction of altruism with the requirements of man's life on Earth and capitalism, uh, the vulnerability of the conceptual level of knowledge to attack from subjectivism, and the so-called is art problem. Ayn Rand discovered the Western tradition, appreciated the civilization it had made possible, and spotted its malicious enemies in their game. She told new generations in America, that's us here, that the historically unimaginable life we took for granted was made possible by those ideas, those intellectual heroes, and that we were under deadly assault, all that we cherished at risk, that the enemies of man and life on this earth had not vanished, only disguised their aim and bided their time. And she cried, don't let it go. In discussing this with my brother Roger, he offered, as usual, an ironclad summary. She was the greatest modern voice of Aristotelian tradition, updating it to take account of enlightenment political liberty and the productive virtues of the Industrial Revolution. The meaning of my presentation today, can be captured by the addition of one clause to that summary. To take account of the exaltation of the human spirit made possible by the Romantic Revolution. If Ayn Rand had been an associate professor at a good liberal arts college, say Kenyon in Ohio, since Ohio had very special meaning to Ayn Rand, and preached the value of the Western tradition, would we have heard of her? Her colleagues would have patted her on the head and smirked. Uh, everyone acknowledges the richness of the American tradition. But Ayn Rand understood how human beings become conscious moral agents, aware of right and wrong by whatever moral code, how they attach to their moral convictions the feeling, this is the best within me. Our heroes instruct our souls so that Jesus or John Galt becomes for us the image of our best aspirations. A hero in simplest terms is the embodiment of a moral ideal. A hero is morality and more broadly philosophy up and walking. In answering the question, what is the goal of your writing, in this case, fiction writing, Ayn Rand answered to create the ideal man. Without this achievement, as she implies in discussing the role of art in projecting a moral ideal, her philosophy could not have prevailed, could not have prevailed against the total embargo by the academic world and mainstream establishment. But now let me add immediately, she didn't view art merely as a great way to get ideas across that were opposed by the culture. She writes that art is indispensable in conveying any moral philosophy. It's the only way. Here's a relevant passage. When we come to the task of defining moral principles and projecting what man ought to be, the results are almost impossible to communicate without the assistance of art. An exhaustive treatise will not do it, will not convey what an ideal man would be like, how he would act. No mind can deal with that immense sum of abstraction. There's no way to integrate such a sum without projecting an actual human figure. Hence the sterile, uninspiring futility of a great many theoretical discussions of ethics. Art is the indispensable medium for communication of the moral ideal. By the way, as sometimes happens, Ayn Rand 
with Ayn Rand. We've slipped in two paragraphs from almost impossible to indispensable, but the point is well made. On this account, she had no choice but to write her novels if she wished to launch her philosophy in the world. Unless, of course, she wrote her treatises and hoped an admirer would come along uh, and write the novels. That that's happened. Uh, Jesus was a philosopher, and the authors of the Bible, you know, wrote the novel. <laughs> yeah, uh, and you know, Kant never wrote a novel, thank God, but some people wrote it for him. Ayn Rand's unique achievement was to identify romanticism, but particularly the romantic novel, as the greatest vehicle ever created to project an actual human figure to project such a figure, not to describe it as in naturalism or realism. And then to realize that to make romanticism the means of projecting a figure based on philosophy, especially in ethics, for living successfully in the world, her heroes must walk through the world we live in now. To do that, she reconnected a moribund traditional romanticism with its roots in the Enlightenment. She eliminated or at least downplayed elements of romanticism inconsistent with enlightenment reason, and so she created what she called the romantic realism novel. In my 2013 Atlas Summers talk on romanticism, I argued that the romantic uh, movement, which is typically dated from 1775 to 1830, had many non-enlightenment and non-objectivist themes. A few of them were an emphasis on will as against reason, intuition over intellect, heroic action over cogitation, fascination with horror and evil, noble sacrifices and beautiful deaths, and above all, obsession with the past. But I argued romanticism nevertheless was one of the three great revolutions deriving from the Enlightenment. Those revolutions were political, in other words, the American and French revolutions, industrial, industrial revolution, and artistic. For all its non-Enlightenment baggage, a great deal of it originating with German philosophy, not so much English, Scottish, and French, or even Russian. Romanticism was the legitimate offspring of the Enlightenment. That is because Romanticism's essence and motor were the supremacy and glory of the individual's judging and valuing mind. That was its core, whatever its baggage. The achievements of the Romantic era can hardly be overstated. In fact, I barely have time to state them at all. It produced the greatest poetry ever written in English. Keats, Shelley, Byron, Blake. Oh, Wordsworth, Coleridge. The first worldwide best-selling novelists, Sir Walter Scott. Painters we consider the giants of our cultural history. And musical compositions that audiences never stop demanding and loving, no matter how hard impresarios of modern music push the new, the original, and the cutting edge. But, Okay. <laughs> but all the great romantic novelists, and the novelists are focused here, the Romantic Manifesto is subtitled The Philosophy of Literature, not Art. All of them were infected by the non-enlightenment features of romanticism. I'm going to focus here on the near universal tendency of romanticists to set their novels in an idealized and glorious, glorified past. Let uh, this be a symbol for us of the much wider tendency to view the present time. That meant, uh, in England, the Industrial Revolution, as just not romantic. The past was viewed through a golden haze of nostalgia, as a time of lost glory. Thus, Victor Hugo set The Man Who Laughs, which Rand called the greatest novel in world literature, in the era of fearsome King James II, with grand courts, ravishing ladies, bold cavaliers, and mountebanks. In Poland, Hugo's great successor in the first and only romanticist to win the Nobel Prize in Literature, Henry Sienkiewicz, set his entire grand trilogy in Poland's past, Wars for Survival and Liberation. A Sienkiewicz novel that is a great favorite of objectivists, because recommended decades ago by the NBI bookstore, is Quo Vadis, set in Rome at the time of the persecution of the new cult of Christ. Ayn Rand called it one of the two single, single greatest romantic novels of all time. Nathaniel Hawthorne set the Scarlet Letter, which Ayn Rand called the greatest American novel in Salem, a hundred years earlier. 
And Walter Scott, the best-selling novelist of the Romantic era, set Rob Roy, Ivanhoe, Waverley, and all his other works in the past. Well, by the second half of the 19th century, Romanticism was dying. First, and especially in literature, although Hugo reached his peak some decades later and Sienkiewicz after that, in broadest terms, the counter-enlightenment philosophy of Immanuel Kant, and especially his successors in Germany, doomed the Romantic era. Kant published a critique of pure reason in 1781, not long after the emergence of the Romantic school, but a half century passed before such ideas gave rise to naturalism and began to banish Romanticism from the scene. Not surprisingly, Romantic literature was the first to go because its premises are explicit, conceptual, and thus readily attacked. Whereas in music, the last great Romantic composer, Sergei Rachmaninoff, was still writing and performing well into Ayn Rand's adulthood. Naturalism attacked the Romantic novel with the claim that naturalism wrote about real contemporary life, life as we live it today. By contrast, the great American romantic novels of Hawthorne, all of James Fenimore Cooper, much of Herman Melville, present values and conflicts that are glorious, dramas of human will, with heroes larger than life. But all of it happened long ago and far away. How did the anti-enlightenment philosophers lay down the barrage that weakened the defenses of romanticism? and open it to assault by their naturalists. Above all, Romanticism relied, relied upon the Enlightenment profile of man as freely choosing the consequences of his actions and fighting for his values. Kant and his successors undercut this view of individuals as aware of reality by means of reason and freely choosing values that shape their character and lives. Naturalism, or later social realism, or just realism, is usually placed between the 1880s and 1930s. Naturalism suggested the social conditions, that social conditions, heredity, and the environment shaped human character. It was mainly a literary movement because, as I said, explicit romanticism was attacked first. Naturalism claimed to depict believable, everyday people and reality. Naturalist writers and critics were familiar with Darwin's theory of evolution. They asserted that man's heredity determined his character. Wikipedia writes the simple truth, with simple truth, that naturalistic works often included uncouth or sordid subject matter. Naturalistic works expose the dark, I'm still quoting, the dark harshness of life, including poverty, racism, violence, prejudice, disease, corruption, prostitution, and filth. In many novels today, that list has been whittled down to violence and filth. And so, the naturalists claim not only to be writing about individuals who lived and acted in today's world, they could claim to be writing about the true human condition as shown by science. They had abandoned the centrality of choosing, judging, and valuing individual, the core of romanticism, for the premise that man's life is determined by circumstances, social background, economic class, in a word, fate. Readers, at least those with pretensions to serious literature, chose naturalism. As the decades passed, the metaphysical reality of man choosing his values, shaping the course of his life, was relegated to popular art. The entertainment offered by detective stories, sea sagas, science fiction fantasies, cowboy yarns, costume romances, and horror stories. OK, this is my pivot point. Take a deep uh, breath here. On to this scene, when Romanticism as a literary movement was a historic relic, a dead language, strode a novelist of genius, committed to the values of the Enlightenment, but still in love with the romantic fiction she encountered as a girl. From We the Living to the Fountainhead to Atlas Shrugged, Ayn Rand's novels resuscitated a dying romantic movement by reconnecting it with its roots in the Enlightenment, and then by asking what ideas, choices, and values must shape an individual if he is to triumph become a romantic hero today, in reality, in our world. In this immediate sense, you see, she undercut naturalism's only argument that it dealt with life as now lived. But that's a mere footnote compared with her reconnection of romanticism with enlightenment, reason, and realism. The result is that we have heroes such as Howard Rourke, 
Dagny Taggart, Hank Reardon, Francisco, Domingo, Carlos, Andrew, Sebastian, Don Cogna, and John Gold. Her achievement in Atlas Shrugged accounts for the almost explosive spread of objectivism after the publication of that novel in 1957. Its triumph against all odds and its compelling appeal today, only romanticism fuses metaphysical truth and the inspiration of romanticism with a projection of individual success in our world today. Atlas Shrugged not only makes us feel, as Ayn Rand said of Victor Hugo's 93, what greatness men are capable of when fighting for their values, but also, I can live like that, because Victor Hugo published 93 in 1873, 80 years after the French Revolution, that is its setting. But Ayn Rand set Atlas Shrugged in a kind of permanent unspecified near future, where the conflicts are those that face us today, the characters are in our world, and their choices are choices we might face. In Atlas, no consideration takes precedence over the logic that a character's life is determined by his own choices, by values he elects to pursue. No significant event in the unfolding plot is coincidental. The choices of the characters as they pursue their goals drive the conflict, because for Ayn Rand, the crucial element of the novel is the logic of the plot. The premise of man choosing, shaping his own destiny, is the one she shares with historical romanticism. What sets apart her realism is the integration of the plot. Philosophical premises shape characters who act on values and reach re resolution of conflicts in a way we could outline with syllogisms. Ayn Rand's genius is to dramatize this logic, but always to reveal and explain it too, as she keeps the plot hurtling toward its climax. The subplot of the mystery that ends with Dagny's crashing through the electronic mirage to discover the secret valley begins when she hears the young brakeman whistling bars from a Haley concerto she's never heard and demanding to understand the seeming contradiction. From there to crashing into the valley where she hears the real Haley playing the same concerto, the logic of demanding to clarify contradictions never lets up. In Atlas, the probing of the motivations of characters, all these is aspects of the realism. In Atlas, the probing of the motivations of the characters is profound right down to the exploration of philosophical fundamentals. When Reardon finds the fatally wounded wet nurse and is carrying him in his arms, we have pages of insight into Reardon's thoughts and feelings that amount to a Hugo-like essay on the tragic betrayal of the young by modern education. The scene is as intimate as a love story because it is one, a love between a father and son. But it carries a weight of philosophical meditation that never would interrupt a decent popular thriller. And certainly not Ivanhoe, for example, because motivations were dealt with in terms of categories such as honor and bravery. Romantic realism means digging into what truly motivates a character who acts on certain moral premises. In romantic realism, the mining of cause and effect drills down through chance, and then human interaction, and then human motivation, and then philosophical premises, until we understand how the chief philosophical premises of our age led to the Taggart Tunnel disaster. Romantic realism means understanding how philosophy and human values manifest themselves in the world in a way that is ultimately completely intelligible. A pivotal scene in Ivanhoe is a joust between two knights in armor. A pivotal scene in Atlas Shrugged is Reardon's refusal to sign over his invention to an encroaching dictatorship. Both are riveting and inspiring conflicts. A pivotal scene in A Scarlet Letter is Hester Prynne's acceptance of the scarlet A on her breast because she will not betray the man who got her with child. A pivotal conflict in Atlas Shrugged is refusal of Dagny and Reardon to be blackmailed by the malodorous government bullies who threaten to reveal their love relationship. But wait, wait, does it matter? Does Hester's keeping faith with her lover, although set a century before Hawthorne's time, doesn't it inspire us with the broad, its broader theme that when we choose our highest values like a lover, our commitment defies the demands of convention? Isn't it as good as the portrayal of Dagny, defying blackmail based on her affair with Reardon? One answer is that no, it doesn't matter. 
which is why Ayn Rand could idolize the novels of Victor Hugo, including one set in Romantic England of the 17th century. And so too can you and I. The emotional involvement with any characters fighting for their deepest values has the power to inspire us because we can generalize and conceptualize. Another good answer is that historical romanticism dunned readers again and again with a message that human greatness, the glory of the battle for values, was to be found in some lost past. We might love the characters and imitate their battles for their values, but the real glory lay in a bygone era. And so we have Minerva Chivi, who loved the days of old when swords were bright and steeds were prancing. The vision of a warrior bold would set him dancing. Minerva sighed for what was not and dreamed and rested from his labors. He dreamed of Thebes and Camelot and Priam's neighbors. Minerva mourned the ripe renown that made so many a name so fragrant. He mourned romance now on the town and art a vagrant. Romanticism of the past, valid in its fundamentals, does not answer for the general reader the question, what values and actions should I choose today to realize the vision of the ideal man? What would a hero today look like? So much of historical romanticism serve the purposes of what we called escapism. Our own lives are dull, routine, boring, but vicariously, we can live the life of heroic struggle for values in another era, another place. Romantic realism means writing about the heroic in our time, but surely it meant more than that to Ayn Rand. After all, she created a more complex taxonomy of romanticism by referring to the huge and popular category of fiction she uh, labeled romantic, uh, popular romanticism, detective fiction, spy thrillers, science fiction, and other genre fiction that she credited with being the only survivors of the romantic literary movement. She loved such works. She defended them, but she described them as the kindergarten arithmetic of uh, literary romanticism. Now these stories, these genre stories, although set in our world or in the future, as an Atlas Shrugged, of course, is, don't merit the designation romantic realism. Ayn Rand points out that their plots, although brilliant, are simplified battles of good against evil. Atlas Shrugged is such a, a battle too, but good and evil in popular romanticism is characterized in terms of crime versus law enforcement, battlers against malign foreign agents or powers. The heroes and villains are in specified, limited roles. There are variations, but this is the pattern. Characterization, character psychology is simplified, although in that limited context, it can be brilliant. The other distinction between popular and literary that Ayn Rand frequently made was based on style. Writers of popular romanticism often have an effective, powerful style. Ayn Rand favorably compared the best to that of supposedly great literary stylists. But think if you grasp what Ayn Rand's style is achieving in terms of subtlety of emotion, emotional impact, revelations of character, evocation of underlying or background feeling, you'll understand literary versus popular fiction. Those issues are familiar to many of us, but I want to raise another question about romantic realism. If a spy story or crime thriller or battlefield thriller is written, say, with literary merit, characters are psychologically subtle and revelatory, say, of the psychology of fighting for justice or the psychology of the criminal? Do we have an example of romantic realism? A very fine novel, certainly, and let's say a fine romantic novel, but romantic realism? Notice that The Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged, Ayn Rand's classic novels, are about the whole lives of the, her characters. From at least young adulthood, the novelist takes us through the career, friendships, love affairs, the great central and essentially lifelong conflict of a character, and its resolution for both the heroes and the villains, or the losers. By contrast, a James Bond novel takes us through one great adventure, one beautiful love affair. A Mickey Spillane novel takes us through one encounter with crime. Most, although not all, popular romanticism is about an exploit. Let me ask this question. If romantic realism bids to let the reader experience how exciting 
and inspiring this life, when lived by values appropriate to man's life, then is the whole life nature of the Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged accidental or is it essential? I'm not at all sure of the answer. Many questions arise. If a brilliantly styled novel about a professional spy deals with that spy's whole life, not only in an episode, but childhood or at least early development, education, formation of ideas and values, the conflict running through an entire career, marriage and its ups and downs and resolution, then I think we possibly have a romantic realist novel. But we don't have a good spy thriller. Because when I pick up one of my all-time favorite novels from Russia with Love, I don't bloody want to know little James's travails in school, his soul searching about becoming a secret agent, the revelatory contrast with his brother's meekness in action from whence arises his passion for his wife. I want to get on with it. Even Atlas Shrugged does not achieve the pace and sustained excitement of From Marshall with Love, or for that matter, Mickey Spillane's The Girl Hunters. But we don't care, because there's so much else going on in Atlas. It's excitement on an entirely different plane and scale. Is there anything in what I've argued today to support the conclusion that romantic realism, as Ayn Rand defined and practiced it, has been demonstrated to be the right form of the novel, that it eliminates the shortcoming of earlier types of novels, including traditional romanticism, that it is the one form of the novel arising wholly from the role of art in meeting those profound needs of man's consciousness that Ayn Rand discusses in the manifesto. For those in the know, is it the only way to go? This is a question, not a lead up to an answer. I do think that in the manifesto, Ayn Rand tended to make the case that ro the romantic realist novel is the pinnacle achievement of the novel. It most fully satisfies man's potential for experiencing all that literature offers. And don't or didn't many of us feel that exactly about Atlas Shrugged compared with any other novel we read? But that's a comparison or rating, not a denial of the value and greatness of other categories of the novel. I'm not even sure I have spiritual room for lots of novels as total in every way as Atlas Shrugged. Or even one more, do you? To begin to wind up things here, I'll remind you that in the Romantic Manifesto, Ayn Rand comments that there's no romantic movement. She hopes the book may foster one. The book was published almost half a century ago. Hmm, how time flies. By the strict standards I've set forth here, I'm aware of no novel of romantic realism written since Ayn Rand. Not a few admirers of Ayn Rand's fiction, and myself included, have written novels, but their work, uh, some of it most enjoyable, falls into the category of popular romanticism. That does not mean it's all crime or secret agent fare. Vene Kolhatka in The Frankenstein Candidate, published in 2012, writes about a political election with depth of idea and character, an integration of a thrilling plot. Pendulum Justice by Dale Holland, he's and his wife, published uh, in 2013, pulls off an extraordinary story about a brilliant medical scientist who develops a cardiac surgery that could save millions, but is stolen by a corrupt Washington bureaucracy. In both novels are intimations of true literary romantic realism, but the authors are, and the authors are in early in their careers. My knowledge of objectives and other aspiring romantic novelists is limited. I'm familiar with most of the novels in the sense of knowing the basic story, but I haven't read them all. But if no great work of romantic realism has appeared, for well over half a century since Atlas and the Romantic Manifesto, and we're seeing nothing like the explosive emergence of Romanticism in the late 18th century. Half a century after the emergence of that, the movement had done its thing throughout Europe and America, though its momentum carried on much longer. But as I pointed out in my previous lecture on historical Romanticism, it was a movement arising directly out of the Enlightenment which in a philosophical sense peaked in 1700. John Locke died in 1704. In the next century, this philosophy yielded three great revolutions, the political revolution for freedom, the industrial revolution, and the romantic revolution. In other words, by the late 1770s, an entire European and American culture 
had been influenced by the predominance of Enlightenment ideas. Our culture today has no such philosophical base. Ayn Rand was the sole giant in the 20th century fight to revive the Enlightenment and its three great revolutions. If a new romantic movement must depend upon a culture's underlying Enlightenment philosophy, then what surprise is it that no romantic movement has emerged? Only, essentially, writers influenced by Ayn Rand's philosophy and novels, and that is far too small a base as yet for anything remotely like a new literary movement. The tiny, minuscule, really, number of true literary geniuses who initiate, define, and fuel such a movement must be drawn from a huge population base. You do not get John Keats, William Blake, Walter Scott, George Byron, and Nathaniel Hawthorne, to name just a few early romantic leaders writing in English, by recruiting at one college. Not even that miracle on the banks of the Cam, which in any case was recruiting the best from all over Britain and beyond. Nor do we have the simultaneous explosion, the emerging of genius in painting, music, and drama that characterized the Romantic Revolution. We may no more expect a Romantic Revolution in our time than we expect a new Industrial Revolution or a new American Political Revolution. To borrow one of the most original and powerful titles Ayn Rand ever gave to an essay, because it spoke to the gathering illusions of an entire generation of objectivists in the 1960s, it's earlier than you think. Thank you. Um, thank you for the presentation, Walter. Um, do you believe that the feedback loop is iterative in that art is both a barometer of the current culture, but that art can also influence culture? Does it go sort of both ways, or it only goes one way, which is art simply reflects the underlying philosophy of the culture? So there's... Oh. Jeez, I think I devoted the first half of my lecture to saying how Atlas Shrugged uh, was the only way to get across Ayn Rand's ideas and that it was explosive and it broke through the establishment and made the growth of objectivism explosive. So yeah, I think I've already said that um, not only does art does artwork arise out of a culture, um, but in Ayn Rand's case, see, it arose out of a culture, not her present culture, but the culture which she glimpsed in her childhood and which she understood through history as enlightenment. That's the culture that that grew out of. So, and yes, certainly, um, well, I don't think that uh, the novels um, and poems of the uh, Romantic period necessarily affected the culture or history much not sure about that. I can't think particularly of it. Um, but romantic realism is different because romantic realism talks about the present time, makes the issues urgent now. I mean, if you're rousing men to, uh, to uh, rage and rebellion um, about something that happened 200 years ago, you don't affect the culture as much. Um, I may come back and again, in the question period, asking about different uh, writers and what you think and how they relate. And I'm, I certainly uh, puzzle about the valoration of the romantics you mentioned. So um, you didn't mention uh, either uh, Jane Austen or the Brontes. And um, I wonder what you think of uh, uh, either of those uh, or all. Roger sat down at breakfast this morning and said, all right, the one thing you and I have to work out, the only thing, um, is why you've never read a Jane Austen novel, or the one you started you didn't like and didn't finish. Um, I said, no. I said, well, I did like Wuthering Heights. He said, but that's romanticism. Jane Austen and um, Trollope and others are novels of manners, he said. Not romanticism. They're not generally considered romanticists. You know what they're usually considered? 
there was a movement that came before Romanticism for about 30 years. It was called the sentiment movement. And it was reacting to classicism strictly by saying, um, you know, form's fine and ancient Greece is fine and Rome and it's beautiful and all the structure and everything, but you're really leaving out um, emotion. You're leaving out feelings. You're not, it's called the sentiment movement. You mean like Richardson and Bernie? Uh, like uh, Goethe's um, Young Werther was the best oh, known. Okay. Um, Rousseau wrote uh, a novel, hugely oh. influential sentiment. Uh, that was the one. So I wonder if uh, Austin uh, came in that period of sentiment before the Romantic Revolution. Well, just as a code of this question, I would say um, Austin is certainly more, I, I would think, I would suggest to you that you go back to Austin and to hell with what Roger says. Um, because you, oh, want, you, want, you want something about people yeah. Pursuing their values, yeah. making serious choices yeah. um, in the real world. Yeah. That's what Austin was yeah. doing. Trollope, I can leave forever. But well, Roger seems <laughs> that's, to I mean, some people really like that, but yeah. I just don't see the, I see the romantic connection in Austin. That's all I'm saying about that. Well, I read the first two chapters of Pride and Prejudice, and uh, not a shot had been fired, <laughs> so I stopped. Thank you, Walter, for a, a wonderful talk. I, I'd, I'd like to ask a, a question about uh, hope or how you might see a romantic realist novelist evolve. And this came to mind in association with the career of Billy Joel, the musician, who, of course, was a tremendous popular success uh, for some decades and, and, and then retired from popular performing in order to write what was described in the articles as classical music, which he's never shared with us. So I don't know how good it was, but one could imagine a popular realist novel as that person matured, yeah. as they were secure, choosing to try to do more. And, and do you suppose there's hope we might see some great art well, from I that path? Uh, Vinay's novel and the novel by the uh, Holland team as two that I would categorize as uh, unusual or out of the uh, ordinary popular romanticism, but they're both uh, fairly early in their career, and I held out there might be intimations there of more. I've written four novels, none of them aspires to. Um, if I write another one, I think I'm just, I mean, in no sense proliferating novels I've written so far. I think I'm going to try to write a, a serious literary novel. We'll see. Um, so yeah, it's the same impulse. Popular writers can be extraordinarily good stylists. Um, I think many of them are, you know, perfectly intellectual and, and deep. So why not, in fact? I mean, Ian Fleming was a very, very bright man. So we'll have to see, won't we? I don't know. <laughs> One of Rand statements in the Romantic Manifesto, she takes the novel and she's writing that, I think in the late 50s, uh, as the, the manifesto was published in 62, so yeah. as the predominant form of literature as at, the, at that time, right? And based on the numbers that I had, <clears throat> had in my presentation last year, I think it's arguable that the screen <clears throat> is now the predominant form of literature, screenwriting. I'm not hearing right. <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me, my throat. That screenwriting is now the predominant form of literature, at least in terms of its ubiquity, in terms of the average person reading no more than one novel per year and watching perhaps, you know, I don't know how many hours of television it is, yeah. but you know, if you include part of that is television drama, how many movies on DVD, yeah. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's about five to 10 times as much consumption of yeah. screen story by the average individual as compared to the written story. And is it possible, because I see a lot of um, hard choices that people make and events driven by choices, not necessarily for good ends, because there's very dark characters, but is it possible yeah. um, for a romantic movement to, to arise on I screen? I don't know. I mean... Um, More than the popular yeah. one, which is in blockbusters. You know, to some extent, new movies and um, t 
television shows and serials have, to a significant extent, depended on novels uh, to generate the stories and such. And um, in that way, I, I mean, in that way, the novel goes on as still considered, you know, probably much more serious than than most films, although they're the so-called serious arts films and all, but I don't know. We haven't had much experience. You know, it's just something new that's emerging. Could a new romantic realism emerge from that? I don't see why not. I don't see why the, the uh, medium would change it. I don't think a new romantic realism could emerge from painting or music or sculpture. It's not conceptual enough. It doesn't... Um, it doesn't present romantic heroes in a way that um, Ayn Rand described as essential to conveying a morality, to showing the model of ethics and all. It can inspire and symbolize that for sure, and does. But I don't think that romantic realism could emerge just from them. I think it will have to be more conceptual and more able to present uh, ethics. As I said, do you think maybe um, the romantic realism novel has to be a whole life novel. I was arguing that maybe it did. I mean, I was arguing, raising the question, maybe it did, because if you're presenting the role of values in human life, um, uh, they're most of all characterized by the whole life development, longevity. I mean, that's the crucial judge of values is a man's life. As someone said, reckon no man happy until he's dead. That was the one big gun that was about to be burned at the stake, who had been a successful king all his life, and he said that. And the story is the guy who was going to burn him was so impressed he let him go, but I don't know. Uh, that also relates to Aristotle's idea that you're not truly eudaimon. You're not truly eudaimon until you, until you know we can see the whole course of your life. Maybe that's where this guy got it. This yeah. was a Greek. <laughs> but um, you had been talking about um, the role of whole life portrayal in the romantic novel. Um, and that brought to my mind uh, a novelist who um, uh, I think of as um, akin to Ayn Rand in a way, um, in, in, akin to Ayn Rand in having a, a in writing novels that take uh, a sort of 19th century approach to novel writing. Uh, into the 20th century, and that's the novelist Robin, uh, Robertson Davies, who's most Sorry. famous for the his Deptford trilogy, for instance. Um, okay, Hotel. I'm not familiar with Hotel. him. Hotel. I, yeah. <laughs> um, but a uh, serious novelist, um, uh, another candidate for uh, perhaps uh, uh, modern romanticism in a slightly different mode, but one of the things that's characteristic of his novels is that they're almost all portrayals of someone's life. Like his, his Deptford trilogy involves essentially life portraits of three men whose lives were all intertwined. Uh, and so it's, and it tells a whole story overall. And it's, mm, you know, there certainly are elements of romanticism, you know, loyalty to values, right. the importance of values, but a lot of psychologism and other a realist elements in there, too. So I don't know what you would make of it. But again, Robertson Davies, yeah. Deptford Trilogy, very interesting just because there's definitely the feeling of the romanticism. Or he has another novel where uh, it's about a guy who um, he's a great painter, but he can only paint in the old master style. And um, so he can't be recognized in the 1920s or the 1930s mm. as a living great painter, but he can be recognized as a great dead <laughs> painter. Uh, something, uh, again, a, a critique of culture that would be recognizable to an objectivist yeah, yeah, yeah. there. I'm going to counter that quote and say with a different quote, um, this is perhaps the end of the beginning, okay? Around 20 years ago, I was talking to a very well-known objectivist who was giving a lecture in San Jose and uh, went on and on and on. I said, well, but what about art? You know, what about writing? What about 
novels and paintings, and he said, he like did not understand, he said, but we have the greatest artist. <laughs> It's like, duh. But we have a what? But we have the greatest artist. You know, like. That blocked a lot of people for a long time. Yes, yes. And I think during Ayn Rand's life, nobody dared to try to, no objectors dared to try to write her. And so I do think we're at the beginning of something. Well, it's and, been 50 years since that was shrugged. And I think a lot of rationalism has gotten in the way. Well, could be, but it's been a long time since she did that. And it takes a long time to make a writer. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you usually think of something as an explosive start, then it gets started. But um, it was an explosive start. Mm -hmm. Well, the philosophy is still going strong from mm -hmm. that initial Big Bang. And there has not been the uh, interest in creating, there's been the interest in teaching. There's, it's been very and It's academic. interesting that in the last decade or so, it's so many uh, people have started writing novels. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm who are admirers, a slew of them. Mm -hmm. There's a list on Amazon. Somebody made up a list of uh, all of the novelists uh, influenced by Ayn Rand. There are certainly 25. Mm -hmm. So don't be so hopeless. But I don't think there are any romantic realists in that list it's, that I know of. I think they're all genre. There are a lot of, there's a lot of writing in genre because that's where you get the sales. If you want to be a writer, you have to, you have to mm. find your audience. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. So, smile. <laughs> hey, I was wondering if you could elaborate on the philosophical and aesthetic influences of naturalism on post-enlightenment um, movements. So you mentioned um, when naturalism came in, it came, got more, much more fatalistic, much more deterministic, and that um, that philosophical change from free will and from um, self, um, self-direction had a tremendous aesthetic effect. I, would, I was wondering if you could elaborate upon that. Well, it did, tremendous, and you could see it everywhere. Uh, it was the same thing, as I said. Um, uh, Any time a philosophy uh, or an ethic is going to get up and walking in the real world with a, a real person, it needs fiction. And Ayn Rand wrote her own, but uh, Kant and his success, particularly his successors, uh, many argue that Kant was an Enlightenment philosopher, adding uh, you know the best Germany could do for an Enlightenment philosopher. He was in favor of reason, you know, he, a lot of that stuff. But his successors were horrendous; they got worse and worse. Um, Stephen Hicks makes that point extremely well. Um, so the people who wrote those novels, I suppose, you'd have to say were with the naturalists and the realists who wrote the novels that reflected that post-enlightenment philosophy. Now, what effect did their novels have? Um, I mean, I can't think of anything specific, except it became a huge movement. It went from naturalism, which was the name of the first, the first, Ayn Rand calls it all naturalism. That was the first, you know, and the only, American naturalist writer I know is Stephen Crane that's named a naturalist. But then came realism, social realism, all those things. So um, it was a very powerful movement, and to this day it dominates. It's interesting, it, if you want to know which philosophy, the Enlightenment or the post-Enlightenment, really dominates intellectually today, you don't have any argument about it because the novels from the post-Enlightenment, from Kant and all the rest of it, are the ones that absolutely dominate art today. So you can see that's what's affecting the culture. So I would say, I'm not sure how much they affected it, but they're sure a sign that postmodernism has become um, almost universal on the intellectual, serious, artistic side, and we know that. I can't think of any particular, like, can't think, well, um, you know, a, a great example of, um, uh, naturalism, realism were the muckraking novels, like the octopus and uh, the one about Chicago meatpacking yeah, and all that. Me. And that, um, you know, they say that Theodore Roosevelt was sitting at breakfast eating about the meatpacking to throw up his breakfast. <laughs> and he became adamant about, you know, re reforming and such. So in a way, uh, it, they did seem to move a lot of people in that regard, I can think. Excellent. Hemingway's novels certainly moved a lot of, lot of young people to 
emulate that lifestyle. Many, many, you know, emulated his, his lifestyle, which was to go off and find a war, a sure lion, or something, and, you know, I don't know, I have to think about that. Yeah, because it Novels definitely... Novels affect individuals. Definitely. Um, yeah, individuals, they affect not, you know, each individual by individual they respond. So... Because there was definitely the, the turn down more into realism with the benefits of that, but the loss of the romantic in particular. I was wondering if you could elaborate on that. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Walter, I'd like to ask you to elaborate on why you think that, I mean, this is, I suppose, a criticism, but I, I don't know why you think that these, the, the, not, the culture of the art doesn't affect people I mean, in contemporary literature, you read it. Uh, you mean it, arts? You mean painting and music and all? All the arts, literature as an art. Oh, I thought you were talking about my distinction between that. Uh, you know, that a real romantic realism would have to start with a novel that couldn't start with the fine arts. Is no, that, that's not okay. what I'm. Okay. I'm asking about. I just uh, you, the, your uh, remark that you don't see how the novels that you're talking about, like how romanticism or realism had an effect on anyone? Over what I, I do, but he was asking about impact on the culture. Uh, they influence individuals of all sorts. I was trying to think of examples about how the culture actually changed as a result of the novel, and all I could think of was the muckrakers um, and the, the, the political action that happened. So. Oh, and then I also said it I, in the historical romantic period, I couldn't think of a way that it particularly affected the culture then, those novels. Uh, yeah, say hedonism and teenage nihilism as major cultural elements in American culture over the last 50 years yeah. uh, as total products of the fact that you know, when people think about serious considerations yeah. of what life is like, like life is absurd, empty, yeah. meaningless, and ridiculous. Okay, boy, right. I really dropped that ball. You're right. <laughs> I mean, if you think of um, if you think of the mindset that a whole generation marched off with after Catcher in the Rye, <laughs> you begin to get a little sense of it. No, I was caught a little short on that one. Of course, um, you know, I think a lot of that comes from philosophy, and we're talking about transmission belts, and one of them surely is fiction. There are other transmission belts, I mean, you know, popular press writing articles, uh, teachers, and teachers in schools for sure, and a lot of it comes through going to college and getting, you know, infected, uh, getting a, one of the ticks, one of the many Lyme disease ticks of postmodernism and coming out and being sick all your life. So, so yeah. No, I think that's right. Novels certainly uh, um, have an effect on people's sense of life. I'm not quite sure, you know. Because on the other hand, you know what they say? They say that the novels you like are because of your sense of life. That you like the novel, you uh, absorb it, you get excited about it because of your sense of life, that that's the way it works. So arguably, kids who wrote, who had a, didn't have that sense of life to start with wouldn't like those novels anyway. You think they're forced to read them, and then even though it's not the sense of life, they get infected? I don't know, let's see that. We'll have to discuss that yeah. some more later because our time is running yeah. out. Thank you yeah. very much. Thank heavens it ran out, yeah.